So we'll call this meeting of the select board to order for June 20th, 2022. First, um, Mike will be here, but he will be a little late coming from another commitment, so I'm gonna get us started today. First order of business is to approve the agenda. Um, I want to just add a little something before we go through, which is just an acknowledgement of the Juneteenth holiday that's observed today. So maybe just adding that right underneath or right before the consent agenda to make that small. I have one so thing to add to okay. then, mm -hmm. um, to consider uh, uh, municipal roads grant application. Uh, where does that go? Sorry, Bob. Uh, anywhere you want. You can put it on the manager's items. Okay. Consider. See. Consider what? Sorry. It's a it's a uh, grant for highways. Perfect. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Could I add uh, one more thing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Skip Flanders has offered to do a presentation on the water systems of EFUD. Uh, not tonight, but at a future meeting. So I'd like to put that in the parking lot for it to okay. be added to uh, another uh, agenda as we see. Perfect, thank there's you. There's room for it. Do we want to do discuss future meeting agenda? I discussed if that yes. should become an item that like discuss right. this meeting agenda. It seemed to work well last time. Should sure. we put that um, at the bottom of select board items? Yeah, or at the end if Phil's okay with it, after managers, but whatever. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Whatever makes the most sense, discuss before we adjourn. Sure, discuss upcoming agendas. Any other amendments? I'll move to approve the agenda. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All right, agenda is approved. I'm sorry. All in favor? I haven't run a meeting in a little while. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Thank you. Agenda is approved. We'll get there. Uh, next is to approve the consent agenda items, which just consists of the minutes of the June 6th meeting. I can make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second it. Moved and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. The consent agenda passes. Uh, now is the time for any public comment, uh, whether via Zoom or in the room, that isn't an item on the agenda. Um, now is the time to come up and speak if you would like. Hearing nothing, we'll go ahead and move forward to Danny. Yeah, Jeff. I want to note Juneteenth. We didn't coordinate. Oh my gosh, I know. About it. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to say now seems like the time. Thanks so much. Now is the time when I would love. I just want to acknowledge it is the observed holiday of Juneteenth, um, marking the day when enslaved Americans were officially freed throughout the country. And I know that we talk a lot about equity and the work that we still have yet to do. Um, and I think that's part of commemorating the holiday knowing that um, we have come a long way and we as a town are still acknowledging and working hard to make sure that equity is a big part of, of what we do. So that was it. Thanks, Alyssa, for reminding me <laughs> that I added that to the agenda. Thank you. Excellent. Um, fantastic. So first order of business and select board items is revitalizing Waterbury. Um, we have Ken and Mark here. Come mm -hmm. on up and join us regarding the economic and housing study. Hello. Hello. I'm going to pass out some stuff. I have some copies of an executive summary of both the retail market analysis study, which is the economic development one, and the housing study. So, this is just a snapshot of kind of the work that was done in the full study so that you don't have to sit here and read. 15 pages. So while Mark is passing that around, um, I want to just share um, a little bit about how this, this study came about um, because it's, uh, it it's, was a great opportunity that we felt was worth uh, taking. Um, truth be told, Revitalizing Waterbury was in the process of uh, hiring an economic mm -hmm. development director. And we met a candidate who we particularly liked, one of two. And um, 
that person, though, um, did not, uh, um, was not hired for this position, uh, was working for this organization called Main Street Group in New York City, and um, he contacted his boss and said, offered to us a free retail, retail market analysis. And um, if you know me at all, and we're a nonprofit, we're not gonna say no to free. <laughs> Um, and then uh, he said, you want anything else? And I said, yes, a housing study, please. Um, so we uh, hired um, this organization. Uh, the person who ran it was um, Max. Oh, Vandervliet. Vandervliet, thank you, it was Vander something. Um, Max Vandervliet and his team. And uh, they were honest. I said, why do you want to do this? And he goes, well, Will you give us good recommendations if we get any uh, offer, you know, try to get any jobs up in Vermont? In Vermont? I said, of course I will. So, you know, it was a two-way street. Uh, so we uh, reached out to him. Um, they uh, conducted the study. When Mark arrived back in March of 2021, he knew what, right off the bat that this was something he was going to work through for the next two, for the full year. And um, the one thing to just acknowledge, and then I'll let Mark talk, uh, is that this is not a perfect study. Uh, it has a, quite a few little holes in it, um, but it was a free study, so it's not like I could really get everything I wanted out of it. But we do f have found it to be interesting. Some pieces of it were very eye-opening, and um, it was really great to have a completely different perspective on our town which is uh, allowing the, which has allowed the RW Board of Directors to um, take some of this information and put it into its strategic planning for the coming couple of years. And on that note, it's all yours, Mark. Yeah, so that's a good background on how we got the study in our hands. And then it's about communication between Max and I, and also we formed a plan, um, project advisory committee, which consisted of seven members, some were community members, some were um, business owners, past and present. Um, I think there was some RW folk on the board as well. And they helped guide the project in, um, in, a, in a way that it made sure that we got the most out of it. So we met during the about year of conducting from March or April to the end of the year. We met monthly to make sure the study was going on, checked in with the senior planner, and it was a very communicative process. So I'm gonna start with the retail market analysis the study, which is the economic component of the study, and then we'll go into the housing study, and then I'll ask for some questions if there are any afterwards. So the retail market analysis study is kind of similar to the one that was done in 2013 by Arnett and Moldrus. They did some similar um, studies and similar ways to gather data, but it was done at a different, very different time in Waterbury. 2013, it was done, how can we and how have we recovered from the flood? And this one's done almost in, you can say, the, the height of the pandemic or still in midst of you know, the pandemic, especially for businesses, was done throughout 2021. Um, for the retail side, it, they came and did actual um, surveying during both the summer and fall season on different weekends and during the weekday as well. They were in locations such as Shaw's grocery store, they were in the farmer's market, they were I think up at Cold, so Cold Cider at some points and were doing surveys not only to the visitors, um, but residents, and then asking uh, different questions. Um, yeah, so you can see, I guess, what I want to say, yeah, is this study was free, so we couldn't get everything we wanted out of it, and it is done at a snapshot. So you can see sometimes even recommendations that are recommended were already in process or completed even. Like there was a recommendation at the end of the retail market analysis study to begin some kind of wayfinding, and very, very soon after, mm -hmm. it know, was installed. It was installed. <laughs> it had been planned for a while. Um, so yeah, you can see they did the uh, zip code study, which showed a big presence of local zip codes from the area. So 
you can see that one of the key recommendations for that was to create a marketing plan to really appeal to the 30 minute driving distance from Waterbury and to see if we do have the businesses that can support the locals and the, and the residents of Waterbury how, Waterbury, how do we let them know that they're here? And if not, where are the holes? So that was a big recommendation on, you know, instead of doing the normal marketing strategies that um, we've been taking in Waterbury, which is appealing to the greater New England area, is to really focus in on our, our closest drivers, our day trippers, and, and it was especially at that time during COVID, you know, a lot of people were traveling in car and they weren't coming from longer distances. So to really, to really market that um, was a key, key, um, key recommendation. Mark, do you know or have the information of how many um, folks took the survey? What the what the size is? Um, I think we the survey. No, I, d I don't know that number. I was going to say I know that on the housing study, I know the amount of residents because. I did the actual outreach mm -hmm. for that one, but I could reach maybe back out to Max and see. I'd um, be curious if yeah. it's a simple number to get. That would be mm. interesting. Yeah, because they did testing, I want to say, at least four different individual times, and they had either two or three people mm -hmm. work in different locations on those same days. And you can see some somewhere was they put the actual quantitative data percentage-wise, mm -hmm. and other was like, so just what do you think? And and you can see some of those key words and the strengths and weaknesses. And I think something that always is good to remember if it comes out of a study is that it talks a lot about the negative things and what you can do, but it doesn't really go into the positives. But you get, do get to see a little bit of that in the strengths and opportunities sections of, so that's, um, yeah. That's the main takeaway from the, the retail market analysis study and I'll, can I interrupt one, yeah, thing? Go ahead. one thing I want to share with you is that this idea of marketing to the region and to our locals has been integrated into our new strategic plan that we're really going to focus on this kind of how do we get the Mad River Valley or the Montpeliers or the Richmonds and Hinesburg to think of Waterbury as a place to go do their shopping instead of somewhere else. So that is something we're going to start working on and thinking. So the nice thing about this study is it is informing some of the work we're going to be doing. Yeah, so then we can talk about the housing study. So um, yeah, as mentioned earlier, there was um, surveys that were put out for the housing study to, to get an overall thought on, on the housing climate, you could say, in Waterbury and where the holes were lacking, what they would like to see more of, what they were looking for now and or in the future. Um, also, during the time of the study, the Maxis group um, went on and looked at Airbnb and VRBO and went to go find a total count at the time of the actual number of short-term rentals, which you can see in the, in the fast facts section of there, which was at the time it was 51 short-term rentals that were available throughout those two sites. And of course, if they were, one was on both, you know, you cross them out, only one tally, all that stuff was done. Um, which is a very small number of the total, I think we have about 2,100 house, the housing stock in Waterbury. So it's, we're not facing nearly as severe of an issue of short-term housing as locations like Stowe or the Burlington area is, which was a very positive thing for us after reading the study to realize that, yes, we do have short-term rentals, but they're, the majority of our housing stock is used for Long, either long-term rentals or homeowners. You can also see from the fast uh, facts here section that just in two years, the price of median price of housing went up 98,000, which is 30%, which is a, a, a really big increase within just two years. And I think a lot of people buying homes right now are seeing that and they, they see those numbers aren't lying. Um, some other key points that was learned from the study is a higher preference on smaller uh, occupancy for houses versus the three plus bedrooms that you see that were built like in the 70s and the, in the 80s. We're now seeing a more reliance and a more want for smaller, you know, whether that be a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, but not, and that was a great percent. You can see about 
85, more than 85% of people said that it was their preference. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those are the, the main, um, the main like background knowledge uh, of the study. And now to go in, they had a, a lot of recommendations you can see for this, but I think there's only a few that are really important and ones to focus on, um, which has to do, has to do a, lo a lot um, with, uh, I mean, has to do with finding that new, um, that new niche and that new want for people on what housing sizes is and to bring that to developers and to tell them that's what the need of people are right now so that we can bridge the, the you know the bridge the gap between the demand and what people are wanting you can uh, see also some focus on ADU about um, for example implementing the ADU um, terms that were done for the interim zoning and the in the downtown uh, design, what was it, down, designated downtown interim bylaw zoning or something like that. The name I don't know, but to keep those kind of recommendations to the full term. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah, those are the main, I think the main takeaways. There's some other ones, like uh, you can see the last recommendation talks about a revolving loan fund for residential, which I think is either now in more place or is planned to be, right? To work with the UDAG. Is that right? Um, you, no? It's a uh, recommendation. It's a recommendation. It's, 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 it's been discussed, it's but it's not. Okay, it's been discussed. Not okay. Or, I know I heard it. Huh? The UDAG fund has okay. already been used for housing. They have a significant loan into the land hall project down here in Main Street. Lent money to the uh, project for the Stips and Graves building when that was built. Mm -hmm. so that one's been repaid. Yeah. But uh, the UDAG fund that EFUD has is already available for housing. Good. Perfect. So that could have been something missed when doing research. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things. I don't want to take too much time discussing it. I'd rather open it now for questions, comments. Anything under the sun. I will share that we, uh, with the housing study specifically, um, we shared it with all of our um, legislators. We shared it with Downstreet. We shared it with um, BGS, State of Vermont BGS. Here, I don't remember his name. Um, we shared it with the Planning Commission, with you. Um, Rotary Club asked us to do a presentation on it. So. Um, this was never going to be something that we kept to ourselves. Uh, we did it as a benefit to everyone else. Um, and I mean, we shared all the studies, but the housing study was of particular interest because we know about the housing crisis we're going in. And though housing isn't necessarily part of revitalizing Waterbury's stated mission, it is an economic development issue for us, and so it is part of our um, strategic plan. And the full studies are available online at revitalizingwaterway.org under the business resource section. So if you want to read either, print out yourself a copy of the full study or read it online, as well as the executive summaries are there. So yeah, I'll open it to questions. Other questions? Uh, does this fall into line with the Downstreet's planning uh, for further development here in Waterbury, as far as you know? Um, I'm not sure their exact plan, so mm -hmm. I would think so. I would think if they're planning on doing some kind of housing, it would be appealing to those one to two bedroom size apartments, for that matter. Yeah, that's typically what they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, so just as an aside, I have a meeting with um, Down Street folks on Wednesday at the Stanley Hall and Boston Hall mm -hmm. site. Um, have expressed an interest there months ago, uh, back before the legislative session started. Um, I reached out to Tom Stevens and Teresa Wood to try to get them uh, amped up with regard to that. Uh, EFUD has 51 South Main Street. Mm -hmm. They have some uh, willingness to see housing 
as part of the redevelopment of that property. Um, Downstreet did come here, I guess it was last fall, maybe? Yeah, last, last, last summer or fall. And uh, yeah, late last summer, I yeah. and, and we gave uh, Nicole or um, Anderson a tour of several sites. Um, I've communicated with Josh Hanford, who is the commissioner of um, uh, Housing and Community Affairs. Uh, and he has had conversations with the Department of Buildings and General Services. Um, had a push a couple of months ago about the Wasson, Stanley Wasson site, and um, actually had a Zoom meeting with Josh. And in that meeting, I told him, reminded him, that the legislature had already agreed to turn that property over to the town when we were thinking of putting this facility at the Stanley Wasson site and maybe that they could just dust that off and get it going. Um, and I told Josh that there was, I'm sure that there would be a willingness if it made things easier, if the state were going to donate the property, donating to a municipality might be easier than donating to a housing uh, mm -hmm. organization just in terms of precedent setting and then we could work with down uh -huh. the street. Um, the commission of BGS told Josh that, uh, well, that legislation back in 2013, 14, whatever it was, uh, was specific to a municipal building, so it couldn't be used. I would think that they could have easily amended it, but the statement that she made was, uh, this will have to go back to the legislature in January to start that process all over again. So I don't know where we stand. I was a little bit disappointed, actually. I don't know if it was, who gave it to me, but um, you know, the Stowe Street Bridge project that we all heard about a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, and it's gonna disrupt the park and ride. Uh, evidently, in that process, without my knowledge, uh, BGS has signed an MOU with the Agency of Transportation saying that they can use the Stanley Watson site as a park and ride replacement during the construction of the bridge. So, mm -hmm. um, frankly, there's a lot of room over at the state complex right now. They don't have a lot of employees back there. They can mm -hmm. use the whole rest of the place for park and ride as far as I'm concerned. Was it you, Alyssa? Yeah. You gave it to me, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, this will all come up in our meeting on Wednesday. But having said that, Downstreet has expressed a, a definite interest to do one or more projects in Waterbury. Um, they, they would not, you know, if they build one, they won't just say, well, that's it. We have to go somewhere else. There's, there's a need out there. And if they can put together the proper packages, uh, and get the proper incentives, I'm sure that they would be uh, very interested in doing something. Um, having said that, I think that most of these type projects are in the early stages of um, their thought process right now. I don't think there'll be anything in place in 2023 and ready to be occupied. But if they can identify a project and start moving forward on it in 2023, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So I'll keep you posted. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Skip, skip, skip. Skip, yeah. I have a question. Um, and I'm not sure Bill knows the answer or who, but uh, back when the trustees were working on 51 South Main Street, and we had a developer that made a proposal that eventually um, was voted down, but we worked with Steve Locke's speech and the zoning and things and created, I think it was like 800 square feet or something was counted as half a unit or something to allow for people who were downsizing. I was wondering, is that permanent now and has anybody taken advantage of it? Or? It is permanent and not that I know of. So, yeah. So the that project that um, Johnson was proposing could could happen on 51 and in other places in the downtown. So that 
that uh, interim bylaw at the time was adopted and is in place now. Um, Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to say thank you for coming in and thank you for sharing. Um, I appreciate that you also presented to the Planning Commission and I'm really glad to see that Dana's hiding here in the back as I call him out um, as a Planning Commission liaison because I guess I just want to say every, everywhere this says regulations, I think it's just a good reminder for us as a select board that that's going to be something as the planning enthusiast that we need to partner with the Planning Commission on. Um, I'm curious for you folks at RW, is there, if you had to pick a top priority, um, from either or both that you would like to see the select board support or help move forward that you feel like you need us to lead on, what would that be? Well, I would say, what I know that your second agenda item is talking about a committee on housing for the town, and I would really, RW would like to be at the table. So my first request is let us be here to help support you as you work on this. We, um, it is, I mean, Mark, it's high on Mark's list, this, it's high on the Waterbury Area Development Committee's list, and this is what we're talking about, but we're not in any position to do the work, um, but we're great advocates, so um, we'd like to ask you to, if hopefully you're gonna put together a, some kind of committee to work on this, we'd love to be at the table. So that would be one request. Um, and then I think, you know, the truth is, Alyssa, you guys have supported us in a huge way this last year um, financially. And with that money, we plan on using it to do and execute and do the work we're doing. And for example, the marketing ideas of really transforming our marketing and tourism programming in this town so that it's not all about tourists, but it's about the region is something we're taking to heart and we're really going to spend time thinking about. Um, and the other thing I would say is that this, the Main Street group, if you catch their name, is about Main Streets. Mm -hmm. And we very much wanted them to consider the town of Waterbury, including the Route 100 corridor. That information did not rise to the top for them, um, but it rises very much to the top for us. And so when we're thinking about the retail market analysis, we're also thinking of how we can draw this up Route 100 to Waterbury Center. Um, we're very cognizant that we've spent the last three years very focused on really a street that starts there and goes that way. Um, because of, of uh, Main Street construction and the and pandemic, we broadened out, but um, we're gonna be spending a lot of time going up, up Route 100 to support the businesses. And um, so I think, Mark, do you think, is there anything else you can think of that we really? Yeah, I think you, you hit on a lot of the points about um, for the retail market analysis side, the interconnectivity of the town and making sure that the different sections, whether that be in the downtown, even from South Main to you know, the south side to the north side, they're being feeling connectivity to the commercial and the residential area, but also all the way up in the center. And if, it's, if there's a way to support that more than just marketing, if there's infrastructure that those projects are thought about and I mean, they're long-term, definitely long-term, just like this housing, as you said. If Downstreet does invest in a project now, it's not gonna be built tomorrow. You know, that kind of funding for, that kind of funding and the infrastructure takes five, it could take five years easily. So it's to make sure you think about this project, even if they seem very far away from you for a completion, but you can see what's, you know, how long ago were they planning Main Street reconstruction? I've heard 30 years ago. and. <laughs> You've seen what's already done for this town in the short time since it's been built. So, yeah, and housing. My number one thing is make sure that the zoning supports the wants of the community. I mean, that's a very hard goal. And to, to gauge the community, yes, you can say let's go all out and develop it, but if you don't have people to support it and people that want to come in for that kind of development, then there's no point of having vacant houses. Alyssa, um, from your recent time on the Planning Commission, I, I think back to, uh, I don't know, it was probably 15 years ago now, anyway, um, we were talking about places that we could develop housing and mixed uses. And of course, we all know in the, in the village area, we, there's not a lot of land available. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and back then, the Planning Commission uh, looked at whether some kind of housing could be uh, developed in Pilgrim Park. And at the time, the coffee roasters pushed back and said, we don't want, you know, we've got too many tractor trailers going in and out of here, and we don't want kids, and we don't want residential, this is an industrial park, and of course, you know, they were the, they were the dog wagging the tail at the time, and now they're gone. And, um, you know, I think that the owners of uh, Pilgrim Park have been relatively successful getting more industrial and commercial stuff over there, but with the pandemic and, you know, commercial office space is still kind of up in the air as far as how good a, an investment is that. So the question is, did the Planning Commission, has there been any discussion about that area as a mixed-use area again? Yeah. So because you could, you know, there's a lot of space over there, obviously, and you could do some things right. and actually have some fairly dense uh, development with a fairly high number of units mm -hmm. if, if you could yeah. use space like that. Um, I guess a couple of things I would say and deferring to Dana, I've missed it in two meetings and now I'm listening in again as a select board member, yeah. but um, so a, a couple of, with regards to your one specific question on Pilgrim Park, I guess I would say as far as I'm aware, the Planning Commission hasn't yet handled it. So to start with, the area they're focusing on for the rewrite to start is the downtown. And part of that is driven by infrastructure and having water sewer. And if anyone read the seven days article that profiles five communities, the lead quote is from Katie Buckley and it's talking about communities that don't have water and sewer infrastructure, which then means for dense multifamily housing, like what Downstreet ideally wants to develop, they're starting like way behind the eight ball with needing that infrastructure before they can go anyway. So the fact that we have EFA and our water sewer commissioners, again, mostly in the downtown, though also beyond that, is a big step forward. Adds to the point with industrial, in the world of zoning, industrial is important because it allows the most uses. And when I sat in Mark's seat, plenty of people called, and if you want to do some sort of manufacturing processing, the only land we have in Waterbury to do that is industrial. And candidly, we don't have a lot. We've got parachuting range in that area down that way outside the village, and we have Pilgrim Park, and we have that other little bit behind Demerit. But really, that's like the extent of industrial land in Waterbury. So it, it's been a conversation that's been broached and I think not resolved around this phrasing of taking something out of industrial. I think an alternate conversation that's been had is could you put housing in somewhere that is zoned industrial? Right, right. Big picture, that isn't usually thought of as a smart thing to do because industrial is making a thing and big, scary trucks, etc. I think in modern practice, folks are now saying, if a housing developer wants to accommodate for that, should we as a municipality be prohibiting and, it? And I'm not, I'm not. Oh, no, and I'm not. I'm I'm just nor am I, and I'm saying candidly that I think last thing I'll write, we went through downtown mixed use and residential 10, which were three of six zoning districts in the downtown, still on that list is industrial and um, okay. the state office complex. I would also give the Planning Commission kudos and say literally at the last meeting on Monday, there was a proposed getting really wonky, but just quite like minimum lot size that controls the density of how many apartments you can put on a downtown lot. There was a hypothetical proposal from a consultant and ultimately because of input from a community member and doing some thinking around what's buildings we know and like in our community that fit really well, you know, condos down by 89 and saying, what is that density? The planning commission revised what they were working on and said, we actually should let this be denser in the downtown to allow for more housing options. So. Just that I think some of that work is in progress, and I guess not to try and bridge, but I think some of it is thinking about how to, we as a select board and RW and partners help support that work that's moving forward in a quick area, because I think there's a lot of shared goals and it's just trying to move it forward. Yeah. Dan, I wanna add to that? Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. um, to be clear too, none of that is finalized. Oh, it's all of this is still draft and in discussion and for presentation of the public. So nothing that the planning commission has discussed thus far is, is set in stone. Um, but Alyssa, what Alyssa said is absolutely correct. Um, and also to the point where the planning commission realizes that housing is of interest to 
everyone in this room, the community at large, et cetera, you're doing work, the select board's doing work, the planning commission's doing work. There's been a lot more discussion about opening up lines of communication, um, setting more schedules for our internal work, and also um, communicating that work to you on a more regular basis, um, because obviously it's, that's going to facilitate what you're doing, what you guys are ultimately tasked with doing, um, and then what we're doing. So just we're, we're very aware of this. Um, and uh, part of the reason I'm here tonight, too, is that we have also had housing task force on our agenda in sort of our parking lot for a minute now. And it's getting out of the parking lot. And so out of interest, I'm attending. We'll report back so I don't talk out of school. You know, I'm going to just add, you know, if you wonder, what is RW? You know, one of RW's goals is to bring in businesses into this town, and we don't do it all by ourselves. But when we hear of, when we get a phone call from Jamie Stewart at Central Vermont Economic Development, he says, "Hey, we think we got a company that's coming. It'll bring in 200 new employees." Our first word is, "Where are they going to live?" We don't say, "Yay!" We go, oh, "Shoot, where are they going to live?" And that's a, literally our first thought. And um, this has happened, you know. Darn tough, 100 new employees. Wow, great, where are they gonna live? MTX, great. IV computer, they're adding 50 you know, more employees, great. We're a commuter town right now. Um, people live here so they can work up in Burlington, but most of, most of our employees are driving in, into town. Um, and then we're not even talking about the fact that Casey's Bagels is seriously considering of closing two days a week because she can't find people because they can't, they don't live in the area and they can't afford it. So, and Casey's for the first time in 20 something years is thinking of closing two days a week. Mm -hmm. And there are tears about that. So housing is, economic development is really important for us. So, yeah. <laughs> we're passionate, I think we're all passionate about it. So. I was gonna ask, and since you just brought it up, uh, kind of opened the door. I was going to ask, where are we in the process of the two companies, MTX and Ivy, that got the veggie grants? So what's happening there? I think you know as much as we do. You know the MTX has a sign on the door, right, Mark? Yeah, they've got their sign up in the street. So they're official. <laughs> um, and I think Ivy is currently in the process of development review board, trying to get their building expansion approved. So. We'll see how that goes. We don't have more information. But they, they have veggies to back them, so they better keep up with their criteria, that way they won't get their money. So. <laughs> oh, can you just say what ADU is for anyone who's really excited? Accessory to dwelling units. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> veggie got me thinking. Vermont. And they're growth <laughs> incentive. Yes. That's my favorite line. Remember veggie one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Any you. last questions? Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for being here. And, uh, time. I'm leaving, but I think Mark's going to stick around for Excellent. some more conversation. Thanks, Karen. So as we discussed, the next item on the agenda is discussing establishing a housing task force. And I don't know... Who proposed putting on the agenda? Was Wee! it me? That's why I looked at you while I said that, but I like, could not confirm. So if you'd like to sure. start the conversation. I guess I would just say, in crediting Dana, as we said, this was on the Planning Commission parking lot. I feel not quite as bad about usurping it because I put it on the Planning Commission <laughs> parking lot and didn't take it off the Planning Commission parking lot. But given that RW was coming for the study, um, I emailed early or late today at like 4 p.m. I have copies for everyone, but basically, you know, I don't think we need to make any final decisions tonight, but I know this is a topic. Yes, um, the bill can have one too with the uh, parking map on the back. Uh, so you okay. can see the parking lot. <laughs> I somehow accidentally printed three, the MOU. Um, That's actually nice. Anyway, so this has come up clearly in many years. You know, I think it's no super like. So we have a housing study, which maybe is yet another piece of data in what I think the community is identified as a housing problem. We all have identified. Um, it's something the select board has talked about. So the most recent references I could find during the time I've lived in Waterbury was in 2018, around when the municipal plan was approved. Um, again, in kind of the planning world, at which point it said, oh, one of the things 
the plan talked about is, you know, if you want to improve housing, you need people doing that work and advocating for it and creating some sort of committee. Um, the one at the bottom that's a little off topic is about an energy plan committee because Duncan McDougall, shout out, um, but you know, said we need a committee to move this work forward and pushed really hard to get the select board to appoint a committee and then has a committee of folks moving the work in the energy plan forward. So that's been talked about in the housing realm, but it hasn't progressed. So in terms of tonight's conversation, I guess I would say certainly we don't have the whole board here. I don't think we need to make any decisions, but I just want to be the squeaky wheel on this issue, which is that I think Again, this study is yet another piece of fodder in the fact that this is happening quickly. There's a lot of moving pieces. Obviously, we've spoken to the ongoing zoning rewrite that has housing components. Again, Planning Commission wants to talk about this. We have RW wanting to be at the table. We have coordinating with Downstreet. I think there's no shortage of work that a group locally interested in this could do. Um, and so I just wanted to frame it as something to just at least take the temperature of the board in terms of what we think and then talk about what next steps would be um, in my view to like move it forward. And you know, we can talk about what capacity and structure and whatnot, but I'll say at least personally, I'm happy to volunteer on some sort of committee um, if there was interest. Bill, in your memory, has, there, has anything move forward aside from just that, those conversations in 2018? No, I, I confirmed that with Steve today. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw this from Melissa earlier today. I said, I think I emailed her back and said, yeah, I remember those discussions, but nothing has happened since. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if, if the select board is inclined to, um, to create a housing task force, you could make a motion to do that now and then solicit membership and then you know, appoint representatives. I know that um, Mary Cohen has expressed interest from the Planning Commission and we just heard tonight um, that um, there's others that may be interested as well. So uh, if it's something the board wants to do, uh, I would, if there's no reason not to mm -hmm. do it, um, I would suggest that if you did it, that you would uh, try to uh, keep a place for somebody from maybe EFUG to be on that committee. Uh, as Alyssa said, water and sewer is critical when you're talking about housing. Um, and, you know, and I, I hope I, I don't say something out of turn here, but um, when it comes to housing, obviously, uh, we're all, and, and economic development both, we're always parochial first, and we always talk about what we can do here. Um, you know, EFUD is more than likely going to be taking over the Duxbury Moortown Fire District. We already sell water over there, uh, and, um, you know, there's talk in the Moortown Planning Commission about trying to get uh, sewer over there. And certainly, you know, in that part of Duxbury and Moortown, if there was more housing available, um, it would benefit Waterbury as well. So you've got to think outside the box a little bit too. But I, I think from the perspective of the fact that water and sewer is so critical that you should reach out to the Flood Commission. And since the chairperson's here and listening, he's hearing that. So. <laughs> Thanks. So we could. Um vote to create the task force tonight with no further action and then revisit the conversation to talk about like the the yeah you could you could you could make would look a like. decision that you're going to do it and then uh, you know maybe you want to wait uh, until you actually figure out what you want for the composition mm -hmm. of it before you actually create it right. so you so know level four could be here you for that. can uh, put that on the next agenda or you know, on the 20th of July or something like that, if you want to. I mean, doing it in the next couple of months, I think, is timely. It's been only four years since we started talking <laughs> about it. So if you wait two more months, it's not going to be a killing. So. Yeah, I mean, I think we, the converse that's just snowballing, I mean, we've had members of the public come and address it to us on more than one occasion. We all know it. I had just been elected and I was moving and couldn't find housing in town, which would have 
take. I wouldn't be eligible to be on a select board if I was living in Duxbury so, or Moortown was where I found an apartment. So, um, yeah, I, sh I, I think taking some forward action tonight would be beneficial and then talking with the whole board about maybe what that task force looks like and who might be on it. Do you have other thoughts? Yeah. I'll move that we create a Waterbury Area Housing Task Force and uh, decide how, what the composition will be uh, in the coming uh, two to four weeks. Second? Yes. Okay, so moved and seconded. Do we have further discussion? I would just say for information, though it doesn't have to be in the motion, we would assume to have at a minimum an EFAD, an RW, a planning commission, a select board, and a community member representative, probably someone also from the affordable housing world, but again, to be determined further. But just for those in the room, we likely will be soliciting a representative <laughs> from those constituencies. Thank you. Uh, those in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Discuss community priorities for community profile and manager search. So this is something Mike asked to be on the agenda. Sure. Yeah. I can, yeah. It isn't here yet. That's so. okay. I can cover, oh, I thought Mike was coming in. That would have been See you later, spectacular. Mark. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mark. Um, so. Thank you, Dana. So we, um, I don't know how much, I don't, actually I'm not really sure what Mike, Mike wanted to discuss further, maybe just finalizing those items, but we haven't put the survey out to the community yet regarding the priorities. Um, and you've both seen that, you've all, you both and Skip have seen that draft of the community survey. It just hasn't been out yet. So I don't know that there's more to discuss until we get the feedback. And so then did we get the a top. final draft? I guess, can we just reiterate, so I'm not on the search committee. To, so to reiterate from the meeting and what happened, after the last meeting, you provided a draft of the survey listing priorities. Mm -hmm. I know I individually emailed you back with feedback. Did you yeah. heard from all the board members? I've heard from not all, but I didn't hear back from Chris, um, but I did speak with Skip, and then I also spoke with Natalie for input. So, um, sorry, I meant select board members, because my understanding No, I said, yeah, that. Chris, I said, did, oh, is the only one who right, did okay. it. But I did also solicit feed so that there Got was it. a couple of from EFUD as well. Um, so I'm happy to send a final draft for you all to look at. I. Um, and then we can send it out to Front Porch Forum and to Lisa um, if you want to look at that before it goes out. I'm happy to do that. Essentially, I just incorporated but all, most, almost all of the feedback, but um, I can send it to you. I'm, yeah, I'm, to be clear, not yeah. worried about seeing it. I just okay. wanted to check it on next steps. Yeah, um, so the next step is to get it out to the public and have, uh, with a deadline, and have the feedback come back, and then we would, um, help use that to help make our decision for the top priorities to put in that profile. Um, the one thing I will say is that um, Rick uh, from VLCT was saying that it's not urgent to get this in because we're not putting it in like the advertisement. Right. It's going to go in that community profile that we um, give to candidates and can be added anytime. So he was saying this isn't like a really top priority piece of information for him in like the next week to 10 days, say, it could be a couple of weeks. So. Um, it's still uh, something that we should get out this week, though. Or, so, and is EFUD uh, on board with the uh, this final draft? Uh, yes, yes. So they saw the paragraph that will go out, and then both Skip and Natalie gave input as well to adjust them. Okay. You don't need any further action from us. No. Okay. Yeah, I can say it's fine, and like Danny says, it's not. We don't have to have that part of it for the advertisement right. as part of that community profile. Um, so I think, you know, seeking the community input mm -hmm. is fine. I did have one item, now that you had that on there, I was gonna share with you folks. Um, so when you're through with that, I'll share my other item with you that relates to the manager search here. Um, do you wanna do that? Now, since this is 
about the manager search, and I don't think we sure. have that item again. And it was uh, at the last search committee, we went through it with Rick, and he had asked for an item on uh, whether we wanted to include how the boards work together, and somehow we passed over that. So. Um, when I uh, responded to him about some uh, updates on EFUD, water and sewer customers in town, out of town and things, I thought, oh, we didn't go over this. I had sent him back a note. My suggestion was uh, to include that the two boards work together. We share equipment and personnel. Most of it's probably thanks to Bill. Uh, and also we share working on uh, policies like the personnel policy, pay raises, and health insurance and things. So that a couple of statements in there indicating, um, you know, the things that we do work together on and stuff that might be helpful to somebody looking at Waterbury. Yes, they do, you know, work together and things. So if that was okay, uh, you know, with the next uh, meeting to include that, you know, or phrase something similar to that in the uh, community profile that Rick was doing. So, thank you for catching that. That made me uh, stuff. So, that's okay yeah. with you folks to include that? Uh, yeah, if we need to vote on it, uh, I, will I don't think we yeah. need to vote on it. I did wanted to make sure you. No, it sounds good to me. I, mean, I think one of the challenges of this position is going to be the fact that they're you're ruled by two different boards, yeah. uh, and uh, how that is coordinated. Uh, the more that we can make it seem like it's all just one happy family, uh, the better, from my perspective. Here, here. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Skip. All right. Consider candidates and make appointments for positions of town clerk and town treasurer. So we received just two, I think. Correct? Did you get? Did you get re receive those emails? I received one of them, okay. which I on vacation last week. So that right. Absolutely. Oh, Beth sent it to my personal. That's why I don't have it here. So we received uh, the letter of interest from Jarrett Dury Agri. Um, you you have that, and Roger, you received that one as well. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and then as well from Karen. Karen. Yeah. Um, any discussion to begin? I mean, Bill's out. Do we want to put you on the spot, Carla? Just in terms of, can we just <laughs> review just to restate the process in terms of? This will be an appointment until town meeting. And this will be the one, like. This will be an appointment until town meeting. The plan is to for me to be here physically until September 2nd as town clerk and treasurer, and then make the appointment as of the end of business on September 2nd. Um, so I have time to help train the person while I'm here. Then I have several weeks of vacation that I'll be taking, so I'll still be available to help if need be. So when would they begin to train with you? Uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. And did we say when we're going to close uh, consideration of the candidates? We had asked for letters of interest by last Thursday. Mm -hmm. Last Thursday, okay, so it is effectively closed. Yeah, so today was the day, the decision day. So did you get many? Just two, <laughs> Karen, and then one other from Jer uh, Jarrett Dury Agri. And Karen King, for the record. Oh, sorry, thank you. Karen. Er, Patrick. <laughs> I'm reading the email, so. <laughs> Karen is in the That's the correct. Her correct name is Pe Petrovic. 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 I would, as you already know, highly recommend Karen for the position. She's worked alongside of us for six and a half years. She's got incredible customer service skills. She knows our 
useful software, um, which is the same type of software we use for things that I do, like marriage, and marriage licenses and dog licenses, tax administration, utility billing. Um, I think you do an excellent job. I also would be the chair of the lady to uh, move that we appoint Karen Petrovich uh, to this interim position starting uh, September 2nd until uh, the next town meeting. I will second that. Moved and seconded. Further conversation? Did you motion say clerk and treasurer? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Include clerk. Yes, both yeah. positions uh, town clerk and town treasurer. And I would just reiterate, I'm glad that we put it out there publicly. I think that was a really good process in terms of things, and I think it's great to have someone with, um, just given Karen's direct experience in the role, um, and that we have a lot of transition. Yes, it's not an easy job to step into. Most <laughs> clerks have uh, their assistants that two would train under them and then want to step up into that position, mm. but Beth is preferring her part-time position, so Karen will do a great job because she's she does part of the job as it is. She sees what we do. She helps with us, what we do. Yeah, it's so. a very collaborative group. Mm -hmm. Right. All, yeah. All and we have a lot of um, transition coming up <laughs> in our town, so this seems like a really great choice for a smooth one in this regard, at least. So, um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. So we have uh, appointed for the positions of town clerk and town treasurer, Karen Petrovich, with many thanks for you stepping up, Karen. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations, I Congratulations. think. Congratulations. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, excellent. So we'll move on to update on traffic calming efforts. Yeah, Roger asked this beyond here, and uh, it's a little bit of a update that I wasn't quite clear with you when I talked last to you, Roger. So um, at the last meeting, we had folks here from uh, Little River. And um, <clears throat> at that meeting, we had talked about buying uh, three more portable um, portable units. Uh, we, have, we have reached out, Roger, to the uh, all traffic solutions to try to get an update on the price. The price that I gave you the other day of 2500 when I went back and read Bill Woodruff's email to me, it was the price in 2020 was $2,500 and we were asked for mm -hmm. an updated price. So uh, Bill is in Arizona delivering his daughter to be a resident at a hospital out there. So uh, uh, we won't forget this. He, he may have heard from all traffic solutions, but uh, we haven't pulled the trigger on actually ordering those yet. Okay. We did move uh, both uh, portable speed uh, radar devices that we have to Little River Road. One was put up on Tuesday, I think, last week or Wednesday, and the other one was in the other direction. Uh, should have been put up. I didn't go down today, but I believe it's up. Uh, I got emails from both of the women who were here at the meeting thanking uh, the board and us for taking the quick action. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep that in the rotation. Um, we've reached out to the state police and let them know that you know, traffic is, a, is an issue in many places around the community. Um, so that's that's the update that I have, and I still think I, I don't think the the price is probably higher than twenty five hundred dollars now. If it was twenty five hundred in twenty twenty, the bigger issue is going to be how quickly we can get it, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know yet. I'll try to have a better update by next meeting, and I'm hopeful that maybe we'll have actually ordered one or more by the next meeting. But uh, we haven't forgotten it. Um, speaking of uh, the police, just in case anybody's mm -hmm. wondering, I did reach out to Lieutenant Wright today to find out if he had anything he could update us on with regard to the shooting the other night. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, when I called him, uh, he wasn't in the office. I left a voicemail with him. He 
his voicemail said that they're very busy and sometimes they don't get back to you right away. I haven't heard from him yet. I was hoping that you know maybe he would have been able to tell me something. Uh, Lisa was here. She's gone, I guess. Uh, she may know more than she's, she's stepped down. down. They, okay. they updated the. She did update her article, I think, late last night. Right. So I'm not sure if you saw that one yet. Right. But that's as far. And there was as an update. Uh, there was another story on the CAX at six tonight mm -hmm. that I caught the tail end of. But I was hoping that maybe he would right. give me some additional information. But I don't have it. So. Thank you, um, Carla. Can we just put that traffic update again on the July five meeting, just so we remember to. Hear the update from Bill again. Yeah, thank you. Um, and anecdotally, I was on Little River Road today and I saw the trooper um, both going on my way in and on my way out. So they're there. Um, that was really the first time I've ever seen a, a trooper there and I'm there a lot. So it was nice to see that they're there. So that's great. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, Bill, I just want to thank you and your team for uh, your responsiveness on this. I think it's been yeah. very much appreciated by our constituents. And then um, moving on to considering salary adjustment for municipal manager. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'll address this. Um, you know, uh, Bill, uh, prior meeting, uh, addressed uh, adjusting salaries uh, for all the municipal employees. Uh, and uh, the one municipal employee that uh, he couldn't adjust was his own. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to move that we uh, Institute a five percent raise for the municipal manager retroactive to April first. And I'll check this out with you thought and you got in their uh, acknowledgement as well. We have a second. Second. Thank you. I feel like you did. Um, we have a motion and a second. I do. I know you just said it, but I just loudly for the record, um, we did discuss with EFLED. Um, and all select board members, so um, we've all been consulted. Any other further discussion? I can confirm. <laughs> <that. I did laughs> not, nice not at that, but I fully agree with the the five percent and uh, so. And Bill, just for the record too, it's such a weird position that you're in when these conversations happen, and I'm sorry that we are slow. I think with the turnover of the board, um, but we need to do better going forward. You know, with whomever is here um, to ensure that, that it doesn't happen like this yearly. It's, so, it's quite all right. yeah, I, thank you. I've <laughs> always been appreciative of what the community's done, and there's no hard feelings. <laughs> and this is uh, very fair, and I appreciate it. So, thank you. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is unanimous and passes. Um, Moving on to manager item. Um, oh, sir. I, I didn't hear where you put Roger's point about me coming to talk about water and sewer. Oh, sure. Um, so, we, can, we can discuss it if you're ready to go before we move on to manager's items. Um, we can discuss future agendas. I was going to take lead if yes. you were going to do, do that it now. before you had Gary. Thank you, Scott. And uh, <laughs> I did talk to, to Roger about two half hour periods. Later, I talked to uh, Mike on the search committee, and he also talked about that, but I think he got a little confused. He thought I wanted two half-hour periods at the same meeting. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he thought it was tonight. He called me. Oh. <laughs> and said, Get the scoop on there. And I said, <laughs> so I called Skip. And so I think Bill and I have talked about a, a time that would work for me was, I think it was July 20th when the League of Cities and Towns is mm -hmm. coming and we could do it after that. I thought doing it at the end of your meeting so if we run longer, we're not holding up somebody. So okay. um, the first one could be on the 20th and then you can decide from there. I would do the water first, I guess. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there's interest in the Duxbury, Moortown, and we may know more about that by the 20th of July. And then we can, uh, I'll come back and uh, talk about the sewer and things 
and like you heard tonight, the water and sewer are very important to uh, housing and development and all of those issues and things. So. So do you want to then schedule the next one on on the twentieth when you're here? And yeah. That's perfect. Excellent. Not just be the first uh, the first half hour on yeah. the uh, on just the water. Just for the water. Excellent. And we'll put that at the end or yeah towards the end of the agenda. So, very good. Thank you. That worked, Carla. Thank you, work. Thank you right. so much. Thank you, Skip. Yep. All right. Now we can move forward. Um, first, starting with discussion of CC Fisher Reserve Fund with Gary Dillon. Come on up. We're nice and early. What's that? Nice and early. Well, I was just going to say, in all the times as a fire chief in 20 years, <laughs> I have never been early. For, uh, I've been early. We <laughs> have been early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the folks around have not been early. Yes, thank goodness for cell phones. That's right. We're in the other room and I checked I was on myself. Yeah. I was in the I said, they're moving through this. I said, the ends of bar the two parkers aren't here today. I, so, I, I went down to the fire station. I went down to the fire station to make a copy of something for you. And I'm like, oh, no, they can make their own copies if they want them. Yeah. So I don't know what you have questions, but I can give you the background first mm -hmm. if you'd like. Please. So C.C. Fisher, Cornelius Fisher, was uh, the longest serving fire chief in the village at the time. Um, he is second now that we've merged to uh, Sid Thurston. So, but the difference being that C.C. Fisher, uh, referred to him as CC, uh, he was the fire chief when they were still pulling this old Seth, 1859 Seth pumper and that's sitting in our station. He was around when there were chemical carts uh, and he was the fire chief as the village progressed in fire protection up through what I would say are modern fire trucks. Modern meaning being about the size of our pickup truck, <laughs> um, but it actually was an engine and it pumped. It didn't pump what they do now, but that's progression. Um, so he was really the, the, the force behind the village fire department progressing um, to what we are now. And when he passed away, um, Bob Grace, who, who knew him, made a proposal um, that the membership bought into because Bob was spot on. And essentially, we created this document that, that's our training fund. We have a training line item in our budget, um, but this is, is different in that when it was created, no money could be spent in this fund, if you will, until it reached $5,000, but even that couldn't be spend, spent. Only the interest that was made off that could be spent the following year. So just, just stop there sure. for one second. So um, the village, as far as I know, the village's fire department has, at least in modern history, always been a municipal fire department. It was funded by the village taxpayers. Right. The fire chief was an elected village officer, Correct. Uh, not appointed by the select or the village trustees or when they hired the town manager. Uh, up until the village fire department merged with the town, there were fire wardens and, and right. officers that were on the, the ballot of, well, actually they were voted from the floor at the village meeting. So it was always a municipal department, but it was always a volunteer department, and then it transformed into a paid volunteer department, kind of like it is today. But the fund that Gary's talking about was established by the volunteer firefighters. Right. It was a fund that they raised. It was not a village tax money. It, wasn't, it didn't belong to the village. So when they produced that document, uh, you know, volunteer fire departments and fire departments that are structured like ours are very common now in Vermont. 
and it's there's always a little bit of push pull between the municipal side of the equation and the I'll say club, and I, I say that with respect. The, mm -hmm. You know, the the fraternity or fraternity it's an association. Or whatever, it's a registered right. uh, So the firefighters, uh, you know, they have uh, like many organizations. Uh, you know, they they have a few of their own funds that they right. you know they raise mm -hmm. money for and, and the like, and they they spend it. But anyway, so you can move on from there. Sure. I just want no, to thank sure you. that folks knew that it was not. Right. Municipal money in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Right. This is right, and it's it's not municipal money now. It's belongs to the firefighters association, um, and so essentially it's evolved over the years into a, a larger fund. And I I don't recall if it was Ed Eldridge or Michael Rock that worked it out with you to have you help invest it. Yeah. So um, back um, when did you become chief? Twenty years ago. So it was, it was prior to 20 years ago. I think it was, um, I think it was Eddie yeah. that came and talked that would make sense. about it. And uh, what Ed Eldridge, who was the elected fire chief at the time, came to talk to me, and I said, "Well, let me talk to the village trustees." And it was the firefighters would like this money invested. Uh, they don't feel comfortable doing it themselves. Uh, we had already started a, a track record of having some reserve funds, so the money was turned over. And it, as if, you know, I sent you a memo on Saturday. I don't know if you saw it or not, but yeah. you know, it started off in the you know eight or nine thousand dollar range, and then when it when the town and the village merged, it had been at the tail end of a trough in the market, so it was about sixty. Or 6,500 when, when it right. went into the fund that it's in now. Yeah. So that money, uh, again, it's the, the principal is never spent. Only the interest that is made in uh, this year can be spent and controlled by the training officer who makes a recommendation to myself and, and quite honestly, lets the membership know there is a process the membership could say well we don't want to do that but it's never happened because it's always spent with good judgment and planning uh, so whatever we make for interest this year it can be spent next year and if that money is not spent that goes into the principal mm -hmm. so it, it continues to build um, we continue to get to utilize the money, although sometimes I think we don't take the money out of this account. We we yes. just spend our own money. So, so, th and this is this is where the rub is for me, and and, and I I don't object, um, and you know it's clearly for the benefit of the fire department. But I think I sent you the email. Did yeah. you read the email that I sent? I did. Yeah. And from my perspective, you know. 2012 and 13 is the only time any money is coming out of it. So yes. it's, it's growing, and, and every once in a while, some member of the public, usually at, at town meeting day, which we haven't had an open town meeting in a couple of years, but you know they'll see it in the report, right. and there's a little blurb in there, and it says the C.C. Fisher Fund is worth this, and maybe they were a firefighter, or their brother was a firefighter, and they say, well, you know, how come, why, where's that money going? Isn't it going into the budget? And right. No, it's just growing right now. So well, we need to do a better job in coordinating with our secretary of our funds and, and having him let me know to communicate with Bill or whoever the new manager will be to take those funds out mm -hmm. that we are spending um, because that's what it's designed for. Mm -hmm. um, so we've already sent this year two people to Maryland to the National Fire Academy. And so the, the monies that we earned interest on last year, and that's one of the things that I've got to meet with Bill with after the fact when the, the training piece is done. So that paid for that. 
we still have our fire department budget, but we also have uh, a live burn coming up that absorbs money. And we have other things that come out of that, like open house, public safety day. Um, and there's two of us leaving Wednesday to go to the New England Fire Chiefs. So that will, uh, that will take up all of the money from the C.C. Fisher interest from last year. And then some of that money that will go over will come out of the town's budget in our training line item. Um, you know, the last couple of years we haven't been able to send people because of the pandemic and it's just the way it is. Um, this year we're moving forward. So that's what that money is for. The money also can be used for public safety day. It can also be used for something at the school for fire safety. Um, it can be used for, um, you know, somebody going to college and we could we, we do have a grant set aside we could use this money to add money to our grant for somebody going to college it's usually this second semester uh, that we pay so that's what this money can be used for can you talk about how the decisions are made when a request is made for the for the money to be spent just because i don't know the process at all yeah so our when there's a training that comes up, I'll either get it in the mail or the training officer gets it in the mail. He gets the same ones that typically I do from the state. And it's posted or people are notified um, that, hey, there's this training. If you're interested, let the training officer know. I do not get involved in that. Mm -hmm. So the training officer kind of manages who goes to the trainings um, around Vermont and to Maryland. Um, he will come to me because I'm the authority, but uh, I don't think it's, anybody's ever overridden the training officer because it's pretty well coordinated. So that's really how it's done. I'm the fire chief, so I get to go where I want. <laughs> but I go to the New England Fire Chiefs Conference because that's what I'm part of. Um, and we have, um, aside from myself, we have two assistant chiefs and three battalion chiefs. They can also go to these conferences. Um, so that's there's two people that went to Maryland. They got some great training there. We send people there every year. It's called Tri-State. Um, it's a little odd because it's Vermont, New Hampshire, and uh, Alabama. <laughs> Fun I'm not sure. It takes place in Maryland. It takes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. At, at the National Fire Academy. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the training there is great. Uh, I have never been, but I've, I've certainly heard. But I would much rather go to something that's geared towards what I do. Uh, so that's, that's kind of it. The training officer is responsible for uh, planning the use of the C.C. Fisher funds. Um, although it's, it's a little misleading in here. It's under old structure. Um, said the assistant chief, second assistant chief, was responsible, but uh, when we merged, we had to make a, a bunch of changes in our rank structure. So, Do you always have what you need for training between the regular budget and the funds, or do you ever um, come up short? No, I mean, it's rare that we've come up short. I mean, I would say that we're treated fairly. I, I wouldn't complain. We've, Bill has done a really good job of working with me over the last many years. So, um, so I guess the question I'm wondering about is, do you, do you have like money somewhere else that you're using for these things? Because so, so yes. nothing's coming out of the season. Correct. Right? And, it, and it should be, and so, it's, we're gonna so start. I wonder, and, and this is just a, a throw it out on the table. I'm yep. not married to this because I'm learning as much as the select board is sure. right now. Um, so in the, this is a little bit akin to what happens in the library. So the library has a trust fund uh, and, and you know this year whatever $25,000 is coming out of the trust fund and then um, the $485,000 is coming out of the taxpayer's pocket to fund the library. But the library has a, an organization called the Friends of the Library. 
It's mm -hmm. a bunch of people that are friends of the library, so they're the firefighters, if you will, of right. the library. Yeah. They do fundraisers. Uh, there are people out there who say, you know, uh, I'd like to make a $500 donation to the library. And they send a check to either comes in here or it goes to Rachel, and Rachel brings it to me. So what we've done there is we've actually set up a, a, a sort of library fund, if you will, and it's the donation fund. So it's the C.C. Fisher Fund of the library. And, and the reason we did it is because if you, there are some donations that come in to the library and the library director says, I know what I'm going to use this for, and they just buy it. So there's a line item in the library's regular budget, an income line that says received from donations, and then there's a line item that says purchased by donations. So let's say there's $5,000 of donations that come in in a particular year. That would be high, but it's happening. <laughs> and the library director says, we're going to spend 3500 of it to by this, you know, ebook collection or audio book collection, but there's fifteen hundred dollars that they haven't decided on yet. If it stays in Fund Thirteen, the library's general fund or the fire department's regular budget, at the end of the year, that fifteen hundred dollars just drops to the bottom line. It becomes part of the fund balance, and it's used to reduce the taxes next year. And the person who made the donation didn't do anything except give everyone in town about an eighth of a cent tax break, right? So um, we set up this donation fund. So any donations that come in that don't get spent go into a donation fund they roll over. where they can stay and the fund balance grows and then the library director and the library commissioners can make decisions on that. I think that even though this money the genesis of this money was private with the firefighters, and I'm not proposing to steal it from them in any way. But I think it's helpful when we have a public entity that is funded by tax dollars, and the fire department and the library both take a significant amount of tax dollars, that we can show the public how much it really costs to run a good fire department. So if, we, if we've got a budget that includes a training line item that's whatever the line item is, $8,000. And the firefighters are spending other money that's either donated or th that they raise through fundraising, and they're spending another three or $4,000 on training. Well, we really have a fire department that needs to have $12,000 of training, not eight, right? Yeah. So, I wonder if you and I can work together. Sure. You talk to the firefighters first because I'm, this is not a, a mandate, but no, no. It's, a, it's an offer that the, the document that you have there might be amended. <clears throat> and I would suggest that it be amended so that there might be a line in the fire department, in the town's budget that says income from C.C. Fisher Fund, mm -hmm. and then a line item in the budget that says spent from C.C. Fisher Fund, so that at the end of a year that we say, okay, the C.C. Fisher Fund had a 10% gain, and that's you know $2,300, and we can show that being transferred into the fire budget, and then we can show it being spent and then that way, A, we remember to move the money over because we've got a process in place to do it, and B, we can tell the public, you know, your fire department, right. it, it's a really good Close fire department, numbers. but you're not paying for all of it. There's sure. money coming from this other funding source. So if that's something that might work. I, I don't see why that wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think we've ever really thought of it like that. Um, and I don't think in the past, um, until I started really looking into this, when I saw it in your parking lot, is that right? Parking yeah. lot? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Was not hip parking on Parking in the parking lot? Uh, I'm not, yeah. I'm not all up on all this terminology. I'm like old school. I had to learn from my kids how to use a phone. Um, 
So I started looking into it and found that you know, we haven't taken, taken funds out of the C.C. Fisher Fund, that we've actually just, the secretary of our funds just pays the bill out of the funds that we have. Mm -hmm. And I do send, like, here's what the C.C. Fisher Fund is right, doing right, right, rather right, regularly. Right. It's not that there's no communication. Correct, correct. That, that's on us. So since 2013, all the interest is go, just going back into the principal? It's going back into the yeah. principal, and we're just spending it's money going. on the other side. Right. Yeah. Um, so I hopefully can get that corrected, because it, it, it is a good reflection of what it costs for our training. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The other funds that we have pay for our banquet, pay for a summer picnic if we're doing it. We do a lot of pay it forwards. We spend a lot of money and make donations to other groups uh, and other people. Um, an example, there was a girl in Morrisville, a, a high school girl that had cancer and we, I think we made a donation of oh like $2,500 $2, because she was desperate family is desperate for money to take her for treatment and we we do that a lot we during construction we spent um, in one the first year we paid for a, a big lunch for all the construction workers and associated people and then the second year we didn't do anything because everybody was afraid I, I get it I'm not minimizing it um, but then last year we spent a lot of we paid for a lot of uh, waterbury bucks and literally gave every worker an opportunity to answer a question that they could not get wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Although one guy, I had to guide him a lot. <laughs> like, I mean, the, the questions are so simple that it was, we're literally just giving them money. Yeah. Um, but it was being spent in Waterbury. Yeah. Right. So uh, that's what we did for that. And then we, I spent some money and I bought a, one crew at the top of Bank Hill, coffees one morning. Um, so it's that kind of stuff. Um, we did get a fairly large donation a few years ago um, from somebody that is anonymous. I know who it is, but I'm the only one. And he gave us a, a $10,000 donation. But for the most part, that's dwindled down over the last few years because we keep spending money on other people and doing other things. So that's what so, we do. So do you have a separate account so you can take donations? And yeah, so we ha we're a 401c something, I, and I don't know exactly which one it is. Mm -hmm. So we do have our own funds. Okay. Um, they are managed by our secretary of firefighter funds. Okay. Um, and. He keeps track of all of that, and he could probably, I mean, he can tell us exactly, by, with a little bit of time, how much money we spent out of that $10,000, as an example. He can tell us how much we've spent out of training, um, rather than using this fund. Easy, sure. So, it, we need to have him, I need to do a better job of having him give me uh, some amount that we have we, we need to spend out of the C.C. Fisher Fund mm -hmm. and then let Bill know who can take it out. Right. So that's on me, that's on <laughs> my guy. Um, and it's just a, a management issue really um, of doing a better job with that. But we are spending more money in training than what we get in our budget, but that's, the village department, and I, I don't have the history with the old town department, so I'm not, I'm not minimizing what they did. Um, the village, village department had a history of paying for stuff. They, uh, the first rescue truck was paid for, 50% of it was paid for by the Firefighters Association. One of the tank trucks, 50% of that was paid for by the Firefighters Association, um, what it was back then. I, don't know. I don't even know that there was a really a tax issue back then. Um, so it's not uncommon for us to pay for things. And could we spend more money in our training budget? I'm confident we could, but we're, we're it's fair, considering we have this. Uh, right, and, and I just want to, you know, make sure. But it should be clear. That, you know, when you buy things, you know, if you're buying equipment that is ultimately going to be 
hours, right. then you know um, there'll be an expectation that that piece of equipment is going to be repaired and replaced right. at some point, and that will go into the regular budget. Right. Yeah, that we haven't done. We haven't bought equipment uh, since many years ago. Yeah, okay. And, um, you know, when you do go on these training things, uh, you know, it should be, it should be paid for by the community because if something should happen, you're in an accident on the way there, you know, it, you're covered by workers' compensation and everything else. It, we, we should, you know, for your protection, you, the firefighters, uh, things like that, should run through the budget. I'm not asking that your whole, uh, you know, all of the funds, the money that you were buying coffee for the workers and stuff like that, that doesn't have to be town money. You, you've set up this right. private organization. But I think the C.C. Fisher funds, because that money, like it or not, is in the town's name and it's the town's employer identification number as you know, that's where the money is. It's, it's town money right now. Um, but I think if we can adjust that document and, and make it easier to just move the money from the fund into the budget and then get it spent, uh, you'll, you'll save some of your other money. From no, I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, I, I, would be, I would caution you <laughs> that you, it, to, to not consider it your money, uh -huh. because that would create a, a, a big visit <laughs> and something that's, that is not necessary. Right. Um, so, because it's still used for the benefit of the town because we're right. spending things. So I, I, I just, and Bill's not wrong, I just don't want you to think, oh, wait a minute, that's town money. It, because it's being invested, does, does the use of the C.C. Fisher Fund require any motion from the select board? It hasn't, but as long, I went back as far as I could go in the, the current system. So we started using the accounting system that we have now, memory. Um, we started using it properly in 2006. We had it way prior to that, but uh -huh. we, we, didn't, we didn't run everything through it. So uh -huh. I went back to 2006. It was still the Village Fire Department until 2009, and I saw the ups and downs in the, in the fund. And from the best I could see, Gary, no money ever was taken out of it while it was the villages. And then sure. it became the towns in 2009, yeah. I believe, that yeah. was when the merger happened. Yeah. And the only time money has come out, and it's really nominal amounts. I mean, I think it was $2,000 altogether over three years. Yeah. So no, they've never come to the select board. They just would tell me, you know, we need this from the C.C. Fisher Fund, and we did it. Probably gets, it's probably in the orders of the town because it's a town check that's going out right. to whoever, so the select board is signing off on it. and. Uh, you know, if the town would prefer not to have it, we can make arrangements to give it back to them. But it, uh, you know, I think they asked for it to be managed by the town because they just had it I mean, essentially under their mattress and it wasn't really growing. Pretty close. Much. It was and just a regular savings. Yeah. Well, it's, it's growing up into the requires it worse than the mattress. It requires interest for them to have any spending. Right. 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 And yeah. it seems like liability-wise, it's this is the best route to take. Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah. yeah. So, okay. so yeah, we I don't say it's the town one. No. 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 <laughs> I hope everybody that heard the first part is her hearing the second yeah. part. Um, and I'll, I'll be clear at the, our next uh, business meeting, um, and we will make an adjustment. Matt Raymond is our uh, secretary of our funds, and. Uh, he does a really good job of tracking stuff, so um, he and I will meet and, and we'll get this better under control um, so that it's more clear how much we spend for training. And not all of it's used for training. Some of it, like I said, is used for, you know, scholarships. Some is used for 
A big chunk, quite honestly, is used for our annual banquet. Uh, we have it catered. We have some people that are invited. I'm hoping that uh, the current municipal manager will actually make it to the next one because we always have done it uh, during budget season. <laughs> okay. So he's home and uh, d doing his budget. Right down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I've offered him a, a part-time job after he's retired. So <laughs> it's not, he's not gonna get the same pay. Uh, so that's, that's worth what that's all about. Um, you know, if you have any more questions, I can try and answer them, whether it's this or something on the, the fire department. that's good there. That's very helpful. Okay. okay. Anything else? I Nothing. think it was really interesting to hear a little bit more, and I think it would be great to, to have you here a little more often than... All I gotta do is get an invite. I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those people that's gonna come to a meeting just to sit here and listen. I have better things to do. I'm not saying that these aren't important, but, um... I have other things, I'm part of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid and I'm running two different uh, work groups for that. We're updating some stuff. So I have enough stuff to do. But <laughs> well, if, you, waste your time, but if, if, if you have a question, I certainly don't mind coming down. It's, it's no big deal. Um, but just send me an invite. Don't think that I'm gonna just show up. Never make assumptions. <laughs> Thanks so much, um, Gary. And just uh, because I'm sitting here and I can throw this out, um, I would encourage uh, this board to start thinking about next school year um, and I know I, I sound like a broken record but every year it's progressively gotten worse this year they're parking they were parking up uh, high street parking on the sidewalk so if somebody that was visually impaired isn't going to make it they're parking on both sides along with the parking and the signs need to be changed as well from no parking to no parking or standing because that's the legal term of somebody that's sitting in their car. So uh, I, as a resident up there, would be grateful if we could solve this problem. Um, because I went by a couple cars this past year because I pick up my granddaughter yeah. at daycare on Mondays, and people literally are yelling that you're going by, but there's no other option. And they're going all the way down Railroad Street. Yeah. So thank you. I just thought, well, I. Sitting right there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Carol. Oh, if you ever need it. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Long weekend. Yeah. Um, excellent. So, next under managers items preliminary discussion on use of ARPA funds, including CV Fiber. Thank you. I need more light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It got real dark in the world. Well, they're all dim value. Just. Yeah. There you go. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Like yeah. Ooh, look at that sunset. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be windy out on the lake. It's scary. <laughs> okay. And cold. All right. So um, I apologize for the. I mean, this was on the agenda. Uh, last week, you all saw it, and I had just intended to, you know, have some brief discussions about process here, but then a few other things kind of came up that I've been thinking about. So I, late this afternoon, I sent you an email, and if you didn't read it, I, I apologize, it was so late, you can read it later. I did also send it to Linda Gravel and Chris Shank, um, just to let them know that it was being discussed. So um, I want to concentrate on the CV fiber part of this discussion first. So back in uh, April, uh, Roger made a motion that was passed by the board to appropriate $50,000 to CV fiber. And uh, Linda Gravel had been here several times. And uh, you know, I had raised the question uh, earlier with her and in meetings, whether or not, you know, how a meeting is passed, I'm not sure the select board can appropriate $50,000. And, uh, you know, she, she said, well, the, you know, she kind of quoted chapter and verse of some of the ARPA law and um, had some backing, which I confirmed with 
Katie Buckley at the LCT. Now, Katie, as far as I know, is not an attorney. And, and if you remember, Linda said, um, well, the select board is the final arbiter, the legislative body is the final arbiter of, uh, of arbor funds and appropriating it. And I talked to Katie, and Katie said that, and I reported that to the board here. And I had been talking to you about the prospect of maybe needing a special town meeting. So uh, we all kind of agreed at that meeting in April that we were going to do this. Uh, I backed down from the special town meeting kind of thing. So the board passed the motion that I just read. A few days later, I sent a letter on April 26 to Jerry Diamond Titus of uh, the CD Fiber Governing Board and told him that uh, we'd appropriated the $50,000 and if you remember there'd be a, a $50,000 match right. and they were going to use that for um, you know connecting the underserved and unserved in water. Uh, sometime after that, uh, probably a week or so, maybe a little bit more, Somebody, I don't know if it was Linda, sent to Carla uh, a boilerplate contract. Yeah. And uh, the contract that I have sent out to you this afternoon, I didn't make copies of it. I have one here if you want it, I can share. I don't have a copy of it. But anyway, I, I kind of filled in the blank where it said, you know, town in brackets. I put town of Waterbury. I put the $50,000 in. And then, um, you know, as I read through this boilerplate, uh, it talked about CV Fiber agrees to uh, ensure compliance with all grant award terms and conditions. See attachment one. So I went to attachment one, which was also boilerplate, and I kind of filled it in. And I said um, that, uh, and when you look at your email, what I filled in is the, the yellow highlighted stuff. So I filled in the blank, uh, looking back <coughs> at older mi minutes when Linda came here and said that there were 86 unserved uh, and underserved homes in the town. Uh, so I put 86 in. They have an average cost to connect each home is estimated at $1,600. If you multiply 1,600 by 86, it comes to 137,600. So I said the town elects to contribute $50,000 of biofort funds. And then I put in the provision that Roger had in his motion that the town reserves the right to review plans and specifications for these connections. And then down at the bottom, I summarized this and said, okay, 137,600 is the number. Um, they ask the town here if we want to connect community facilities. Uh, I assume if this is going to go forward and there's going to be fiber that goes right by here as opposed to Comcast cable at some time, we would do it. But it wasn't part of our motion, so I didn't, I didn't add any of these things here. I'm sure at a later date we can add them and pay for the connection if, if we need to. So I left those as zero. So 137.6, $50,000 from ARPA, $50,000 from the matching funds. So now we're up to 100. So I added, there's a potential shortfall of 37,600. I don't know how that's getting funded. And then I put in, again, the provision that this board talked about. If ARPA funds appropriated from Waterbury remain unspent in this process, the funds will be returned to Waterbury. So this is ready to go. Um, I said in my memo to you that uh, it's their boilerplate. I'm not an attorney. Uh, it looks pretty safe to me. I've added these things. So if the select board desires to, you can uh, authorize uh, Mike to sign this. He's the chairperson, and there's a signature line for the chairperson of the town. Uh, you can authorize Mike to sign this, and what I would do then is send it to CV Fiber and said, here's our signed agreement, pay attention to the things that are in yellow, those are things that we added. If you like it, you can sign it and send it back to us and we're off to the races. If you don't like the things that are in yellow or you have uh, alternate language to 
uh, propose, send it back to me, and don't sign it, and we'll deal with it at the next meeting. So anyway, on that hand, it's ready to go. Um, but I'm still a little uneasy about whether we really have the authority to spend this money. And I, I, in, the memo, in the email that I sent to Linda and Chris, I told them, I said, you know, I'm not going to be around next year to, be the, to answer for this. You know? So I did call, uh, actually not call, and I don't know if I brought it with me. Um, so I, I, not because of the CD fiber thing, but on April 20th, I sent an email to uh, Fred DuPlessis, who is the lead accountant for Sullivan and Powers, who does the town's audit. And if you remember, when we went through the budget process, when we started budgeting in early January, I was telling you that um, you couldn't use this money for traditional infrastructure stuff because there was going to be an infrastructure job uh, bill coming down the pike. Uh, that the, the law contemplated municipalities figuring out how much lost revenue they had and you could use up to the amount of lost revenue that you identified for anything that you wanted and you could do that through your normal budgeting process. And so I had calculated our 2020 lost revenue and then when 21 ended, I asked Michelle, the bookkeeper, I said, run this through the Nemeric calculator that they had built the year before. And Michelle couldn't remember exactly all the steps that she was supposed to do. So she reached out to Nemeric. And somehow I had missed it, but the person at Nemeric said, oh, you don't have to bother with that anymore because Congress has changed the law. And now any municipality can consider up to $10 million of whatever they got from opera as lost revenue. So you don't have to do the calculation anymore. You just can appropriate it through your regular budget process. So what we did in our regular budget process, if you remember, is we appropriated $100,000 for the ICE Center. And then there's about $90,000 that I have going into the highway fund to, to pay for some shortfalls in the highway budget. So we've appropriated 190 plus the 600 that we were going to give to EFUD that they canceled out on us by not turning over the uh, UDAC fund. So anyway, in April, I got the scratching my head and I was preparing for the audit process. And you know, if you look at our chart of accounts, we have our general fund is fund 11, our highway fund is fund 12, library is 13, and then, you know, the uh, CIP funds are in the 70s, and we've got the tax stabilization fund. And when we get our audit back, um, you know, the general fund balance that the auditor reports is three or four times higher than what I'm showing. So finally, I, I figured it out, and I said, guys, um, what's in the general fund besides our Fund 11? Because, you know, I think our Fund 11 has $100,000 of the fund balance, and I could live with it if it was, if you found that it was 80 or 120 based on tax collections, but it shouldn't be, you know, $412,000. And they said, oh, well, generally accounting, generally accepted accounting principles say that, you know, your highway fund is a general fund. It's a general government op operation. Uh, your library is a general government operation. So those three funds are the general fund, the library, and the highway are all just general fund money. Uh, a bunch of the uh, reserve funds, like we have a, a restoration fund where money is coming from uh, Recordings, and that's considered general fund money. Uh, the money that we get for um, uh, probably probably the money that we get for the uh, reappraisal fund is, from their accounting standpoint, it's a general fund government function. So anyway, so I wrote them a an email, and I said, look. Uh, given the significant changes in how the ARPA funds can be 
used, which is up to $10 million can be used for just general appropriations. And we didn't do that this year. So we've got $775,000 still parked in Fund 87, our ARPA fund. And sometime this year, the money will move, $100,000 will come in and go out to the ICE Center. $90,000 will come in and go into the highway fund. The 600000 for EFUD will just stay there. And then in the fall, we're going to get another 775000 So our total will be about one6 and we'll have spent about 200 of that, right? So I explained the town received its 269 on August 10th, and then another one from the county of 500 in, in September. So we had received 770000 and I explained to them that the town select board has made a motion to uh, consider the ARPA funds that we're going to use the lost revenue calculation in terms of our appropriations for it, even though we still have until 2026 to spend it. So I said, can we simply call Fund 87 part of the general fund, so that way it's already part of the fund balance, and when we get to next year's budgeting process, it's, it's there. Um, I said, we already do that with several funds, including the highway and the library funds, and I explained that the town said this. So it would be easy for me. So they didn't respond by email, probably because they don't want to be held to it. <laughs> but, but Fred called me and he said, well, um, I understand what you want to do, but you can kind of decide to spend all that money now by kind of um, substituting that for other things, but that's a little complicated. Um, if you want to do what you're talking about, you really should have the voters put it in the general fund because they're the legislative body of the town when it comes to, to budgets. So I stopped him and I said, well, the select board voted a couple weeks ago uh, to, um, to, to give $50,000 to CB5. And he said, well, was that in their budget? And I said, no, they just voted on it uh, at their last meeting. He said, well, the select board doesn't have the authority, in my opinion. I mean, he's not a lawyer either, and he's not going to sue us if we do it, but there, there might be a note in next year's audit. But he said, you know, um, it, it, really need, it really should go through your budgeting process. And I said, well, you know, we talked to people at the LCT, and Katie Buckley said that, you know, the law says it's the legislative body who has the final authority. He said, well, you know, it does say that, but he said, in most of the country, you know, the city council is the legislative body. They make the decisions. But in Vermont, the legislative body recommends a budget to the voters, and they're really the appropriating body. He said, you know, you, you put a, a, together a budget in January, you bring it to the voters at town meeting, the select board has approved it, but if they amend the motion and, and cut $50,000 or $100,000, that's what it is. So he said, I think it's the town meeting that has to do this. So I just bring this to you for your information. It doesn't really, I don't have strong feeling one way or the other. If we live with what we said we were going to do with CV Fiber and you want to sign this agreement, you sign it, uh, the money will, will go to them. And uh, I'm sure that even though I will not be the municipal manager any longer, um, I had always planned on being involved in the audit because most of the decisions that the auditors are going to be asking questions about will have been done while I'm here. And since I expect I'll still be living in Wabri at the time, you know, I'll, I'll help out. But I just want you to have kind of full information. So there's three options. So there's one option that, just let me finish, okay. Mike. One option is you authorize Mike to sign this and we send it to him um, and, and then have them look at the things that I added. The second option is we send this boilerplate with my amendments to our own attorney and see what they have to say. 
And the upside of that is that maybe they say something different. The downside is it's going to cost a couple thousand dollars before you're done. Uh, and then the third option is we tell CV Fiber that we don't have the authority to do this. We need to have a town meeting and we'll either do it next year or you call a special town meeting before the end of this year sometime, preferably sooner rather than later because they keep telling you that um, you know the money, um, the matching money is kind of up for grabs and the sooner that somebody um, latches on, the, the more chance you get it. So I, I don't mean to drop this on you right now, and if you want to think about it, I don't think it will harm anybody. CV Fiber, Linda, you know, hasn't been bugging me about this. I don't know if she's she has called been, you. She hasn't emailed us about it, um, about the contract. Yes. Okay. Oh, so. My, my goodness. Other so, towns have done this, though. Yeah. 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 At least two that I know. The question I have. Our order is going to find this as a material witness, a weakness in our audit. Well, they've already found some material weaknesses that right. we'll be dealing with. Um, you know, and the material weaknesses on the on the the most recent town audit, which they'll be finalizing now. I got to remember what that material weakness is. Um, is going to be significant material. You know, it, we don't have our own uh, credit rating anyway. Right. Uh, it hasn't it hasn't been a problem when we've tried to finance anything with a bank or a bond bank, and and uh, the the weakness that they're talking about is, uh, you know, th my response was uh, to the weakness is I'm going to have to uh, hire a consultant to come in and help us with how we post whatever it is. And I, I can go in the other room and get it if you if you want to know what it is. But as I told you before, I mean, I'm pretty good with numbers, and I'm pretty good with putting the financial statements together, but I'm not a CPA, and there's a couple things that, like, it probably has to do with capital spending. Or that's what it was. It was, mm -hmm. it was grants. So we get a grant, and it's like you're supposed to, uh, you know, credit the grant income line, and then debit the deferred outflows or inflows line. I'm, I, I don't even know what that is. So I'm going to have to get somebody in here to, to help with that. So I'm not really afraid of a material weakness, um, Mike, if they, if they say, you know, there, there's no way to claw the money back. The worst case right. scenario is the federal government could say, you did this wrong, you, you got to pay us the $50,000 back. But I, I don't think the likelihood of that is pretty slight. No, the way the offer money was spelled out, it seemed like we had pretty much carte blanche, especially with this you know, lost revenue. Yeah, we do have carte blanche. And, and, and Fred is agreeing with that, but he's saying you have carte blanche through the legal process of the state of Vermont, yeah. which is the town meeting gets to appropriate the money, and not the select board. And so that's, that's where we're a little off. Now, having said that, there have been plenty of examples over the years where uh, something comes up, um, you know, a piece of equipment breaks or gets damaged in an accident. We have to replace it. Um, it's not in the budget. We, we go out and we buy it and we we tell the voters about it next year, we carry the deficit forward, and then we, we pay for it. I mean, the system that that we have, as much as I like town meeting, you know, was created in the 1800s when, you know, you could look in the town report and, you know, all 75 orders of the select board were written in there, and most of it was, you know, um, putting ashes on the street to prevent people from slipping or on the sidewalk. Yeah. And, you know, or a or a you know a hundred dollar payment by the overseer of the poor for somebody, you know? Yeah, I know. Uh, so the system is the system and the laws are not really haven't really caught up to practice. So 
I, I feel it's my obligation to tell you what I know to be the case. And if you decide, you know what, we're going to live with the deal we made with CD Fiber and we'll deal with the auditor's questions later, I can live with that. I just don't want you not to have the information, that's all. Initial thoughts or questions? Um, I think it sounds like it, it likely won't be a huge issue if we wait till next meeting. And I wonder if it's worth re, like revisiting that statute and reaching out again to some other folks, maybe at BLCT, to see if we can get a more solid answer. I know a couple other towns have done it, and so we can see maybe they've consulted. Um, we could talk to Linda about who that, which the towns those were, and then revisit on the 20th. I agree. Then. <laughs> so, if you want to do that, then what I would what I would offer is let's anyway. you know don't have Mike sign it. Let's at least send to CD Fiber right. their boilerplate with my amended language to make sure that they're okay with that, mm -hmm. and then tell them we're going to deal with this on the fifth of July. If you're okay with this language, get it back to us. And, I, and I'll let them know. I mean, I already let Linda and, mm -hmm. and Chris know about what I just told you. So I'll send this um, off uh, to the CD Fiber formally uh, and tell them, here's some amended language to try to capture Waterbury's uh, um, feelings about this. So why don't we do this? Uh, I sent you all an email this mm -hmm. afternoon that has this with the yellow language on it. Read through that to make sure that what I've said reflects what you believe the town has said. Try to get that back to me by Thursday or Friday. And you know, just individual. Mm -hmm. uh, don't send it to everybody. Just send it to me. And then if you say, ah, oh, you got this wrong, I'll I'll try to work it out. But that way you'll have a chance to have read it. So get it back to me in the next couple days, and then I'll get it off to them by the end of the week and tell them we've got to work this out. I'll call um, Katie, and if I'll call, maybe I'll talk to Ted Brady. Um, and if I have to, I'll, I'll talk to an attorney. Now, that would be my last resort, because I don't yeah, have to pay right. money if I don't have to. So. Do you need a motion? To no, I don't think so. Does that work for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Okay. I appreciate you raising it. And I guess the one I would say, like, and I don't want to, again, open another camera. Like, I think there's, and maybe part of this will transition it to part B. Was your intention being that any ARPA process based on this understanding would need to be a budgeted item that was then approved by town yes. meeting? That, yeah. that is, I just want to reflect, like, to me, that's the carry on thing. I'm, I'm not an honor, I'm not an attorney, I'm none of the things. I guess to me, that, that, sounds at least in my head very different from how I feel like at least the LCT is talking about it to be really candid and maybe that's me missing the nuance so I, I'm not disputing that it's wrong I don't know what it is I'm just saying like to me it's a funny even again thinking about what I do during the day all we're talking about is oh use your ARPA funding as matching for this grant and different things and just the level of budget processing that this chain is yeah, unlocking the, feels a little different I mean, the, so that's just odd to me I'm not saying the, it's wrong it's, the, using it Using it as lost revenue, and, and to me, it, it makes sense. And it may, you know, maybe I'm reading more into it than I should, but when, when the Congress said you can use up to $10 million as lost revenue, so what that means in my mind is that the $1.6 million that's in the, that we receive simply drops into our general fund and it's fund balance money. And at that point, it's handled like every other Got it. every other budget. So when I, whoever presents a budget to the select board in the in January is going to say, well, um, you know, we had a pretty good year. We had a two hundred thousand dollar fund balance, and oh by the way, we've got one point five million dollars over here, and now we can deal with it. And you can. You've got to spend it by 2026. You've got to appropriate it by 2024. So the expectation is that you'll have some conversations with the voters about what things are important. 
and then you can just fund it through the budget. It doesn't have to necessarily be special articles or anything else. And to me, I think that's really kind of timely. Um, what I was going to talk about other uses is, so if, if I find out that Fred is right, that the voters are going to have to say, move this money into the general fund, and now it's part of the general fund. Well, we can make assumptions, because they're, unless you have a special town meeting, the voters aren't going to do that until March. So you could build a budget where you recommend to the voters to identify or to designate the ARPA money as general fund money. And you could also build a budget that spends all or some of that fund balance, if you will, yeah. and, and have the voters make a decision on that at the same meeting. It doesn't have to be one meeting to put it in the general fund and then another meeting to spend it. So I think you can do it all uh, at, at March meeting. And that's how I would do it. And, and again, you don't have to spend it all at once. You could say, all right, we've identified this as general fund money. We have a general fund balance of $1.4 million. And we're going to spend um, $750,000 in 2023. And we're going to leave the rest. And we'll spend that fund balance the next year in the, in the budget process. Of course, you know, you might put it like that. You could have groups out there circulating petitions, asking mm -hmm. for special articles. So, you know, I'll try to get more information, yes. but uh, no. Questions. it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Danny's running okay. so. Go ahead, Mike. Could I speak to Yeah, of course. Either. Okay, uh, this is both for Carla and Bill. What is the cost to the voters of a special, if we had a special election, roughly? It's pretty minimal because it's we a, produce our own ballots right. and it's relatively low turnout mm -hmm. typically. Yeah, and it's frankly, we don't even have to produce a ballot because we we deal, we have open town meetings, so. All right. So do a voice, voice so, vote. Yeah. It's you know, minimal. You could, you could warn a meeting for, you know, uh, August 8th, you know, and, and deal with the CD fiber thing and deal with the, with the rest of it, saying it's going in the general fund. Um, and, the, you know, the, there's not a lot of risk because the select board is the one that's putting the agenda together. So you put the articles on there that you want. They could be voted down. Right. You know, the select board could say something. They could be amended. That's the that's the risk that right. well, you know, somebody says, well, let's give three hundred thousand to C V five. Um, uh, but that's unlikely to happen. Um, the challenge is that do you really want to do that? Because pretty typically Special town meetings have really low turnout. Mm -hmm. Right, and very low. low is that damage. kind of how you want to win the government? Mm -hmm. so you could have, you could call yeah. a special town meeting for this room on a select board right. meeting. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just looking at more as a procedural matter to avoid some of the other kind of issues that we may be facing yeah. by not doing things right. But I see both sides. Yeah, I well, think that's, what, that's what I want to avoid too. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to get hung up on some technicality and have exactly. it be a problem down the road. So, um, and without a uh, special uh, town meeting, we would have to appropriate all the ARPA funding either next uh, March or the following March, yes. and that would be the last opportunity. Yeah, to have appropriate, appropriate, appropriate yeah. to have until the end of 2026. Right, but we'd have to get the appropriations done yes. by in the uh, in March of 2024. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Of course, special meeting in December of 2024. Right. But right. So by the end of 2024, you have to have an appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we will all get back to Bill.
individually regarding this contract by the end of this week, and then he'll forward it on. You'll be in touch with the LCT, and um, we'll double check. So Carla, can you also put this on the agenda for next meeting again? And if Bill is contacting CB Fiber, anyway, I guess one question I just had is we made the $50,000 with the premise that's being matched $50,000. If we ended up ultimately spending less than the $50,000, can they not ask for less match? I guess that's their problem with CB Fiber applying to the Community Broadband Board. I just, I mean, I asked it to go from 75 to 50 because I didn't think we even were doing all 86. I wouldn't assume there's a minimum. minimum. I just didn't know, like, is it a one-to-one yeah, -one match? I, I, I think spend? the likelihood that they're going to underspend is Love. minimal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, um, we they asked for 75, we offered 50. Um, I wouldn't get too hung up on that. And, and, you know, if we haven't conditioned the 50 on the match, we're hoping that there's a match available, but right. if the match money runs out, they can still spend our 50 and then we'll have a shortfall. And, and, and again, to your point, you didn't know we were going to connect all 86. Right. I, I believe the motion that Roger made and the intent was, you know, yeah, you can spend some of this money, but before you do anything, we want to see what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. That's really what mm -hmm. you said, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Still not convinced this whole thing's going to work out. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> Different conversations. Um, anything else on CV Fiber? Great. So lastly, we have Bill's added item of considering the road management grants. Are we doing any other ARPA other uses conversations? Sorry, I wasn't clear if that was oh, all along. Or, or is I that think we're going to table it until we hear more? Yeah, we, we, let's wait until we hear more. All I was going to say on the other uses is, you know, um, assuming that it's all general fund money and it has to be appropriated through the budgeting process, that we typically don't have, you know, million dollar fund balances. So my question was, does the board want to start talking about how to use ARPA money yes. before your regular budget process starts in January? Yes. So. <laughs> right, and that, I guess my question is I didn't know how much of that conversation we were having around. Is it just us as a board spending an extra million dollars or to what extent and how we're soliciting community input for that process? So I mean, that's, that can be part of the follow-up conversation. I just, in my head, thought that was yeah. what that I think it changed. It, I think it was, and then it changed when this became a 45-minute CV5 yeah, agenda item. So I had written down to add it back to the parking lot for allocation of ARPA funds right. conversation. And, you know, these meetings are public meetings, so the, you can either just do it in a select board meeting or you can call a you know, public information meeting or whatever hearing, but it's the mm -hmm. same thing. It's who shows up. So. Well, and spending aside, though, that's one where there is more models from other communities. I mean, I linked in the email, like, you can look at what town has created a housing task force and how. You can look at what communities have created an ARPA task force and how. And I'm not saying we want to do any of those things, but I think that's a worthwhile conversation for us to at least yeah. have. Okay. Are you ready to? Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank no. you. Um, road management grant. Yeah, so... Um, there's a, a state grant that we're eligible for that we've received money for for a number of years. This is for um, hydrologically connected municipal roads. And Bill Woodruff has already taken care of all of this. And he actually sent it in because we talked about it uh, earlier. And as I told you, he's in Arizona right now. And I guess he had a Bill Shuffleck moment the other day and probably woke up in the middle of the night and said, wow, um, I wrote on the grant that Bill Shuffleck was the authorized representative, but Woody signed it and sent it in. Uh. So now he's freaking out that they're not going to accept it. So if you can just make a motion to apply for the funding that's available through the Municipal Roads Grant Aid Program, for hydrologically connected municipal roads and authorize me to sign it. I'll do it and 
send it in before the 24th. Charlie, you got that motion? Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll make a motion. <laughs> just like Bill said. Yeah, I just need to see that now. Perfect. I can give it to It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and second. Is there further discussion? Excellent. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. That was unanimous and that passes. Thank you for handling it, Bill. Sure. Um, great. Uh, one other thing. I didn't, I didn't seek to add this. Can I bring something up? Can we? I don't see it's a problem. <laughs> um, you're not going to have to take any action. We're okay. just going to talk about it. So um, the budget included this community service officer right. um, mm -hmm. that we we're going to try to hire that would address issues like ordinance enforcement and the like. Um, the community service officer um, was budgeted to come on board sometime in July. Um, and the community service officer is, it was, the position was designed that it would report to the director of community services, which is Nick. Um, and I haven't, I have not advertised for this position yet. Um, and um, I'm wondering if we should right now. Um, we're still a little up in the air in terms of personnel issues. Um, and if we hire somebody, you know, we're in a period of transition, right? So we may have this conversation down the line about other people, but at some point, does it make sense for me to be filling <coughs> positions that somebody well, else is going to inherit? Um, and uh, I'm wondering about, A, you know, I'm, I'm still skeptical based on the labor market right now and the challenges that we've had hiring other people uh, for a fairly esoteric job description which anticipates the one person who's going to take this job is kind of going to be available seven days a week around the clock because if you get a call about somebody's dog, you have to deal with that. If you get a call about somebody who wants their um, rental housing unit inspected, you've got to deal with that. Uh, if we're going to be having them, you know, uh, try to address the issues that Gary was raising up at school. So I'm not convinced we're going to get anybody for this position at the price that we're, the, the wage which is in the low 20s per hour. Uh, so I just wanted to know whether you think we should move forward with it, uh, see if anybody's interested, and then we can make a decision at that point. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just looking for a little bit of direction from the board. I did look at the budgets today. Um, uh, there are some things that we know that we're going to be over budget in. Um, and, and some of them are personnel uh, decisions that were, were made that were cost more than was in the budget. Um, we've spent 82% uh, of our diesel fuel budget in the highway department and 62% of our gasoline budget in the highway department. And I'm sure we're going to, you know, yeah, we're gonna going to be at 100% probably by Labor Day. Um, yes. Gas price actually went down um, 10 cents up on Route 100. Between yeah. this morning and we were seeing up, up and down Route 7 but, car. Uh, you know, we know that they're they're going to stay up there. And yeah. then um, there's a few, you know, we had a terrible mud season. Right now, uh, I didn't do a full budget report, but we're almost halfway through the year. Um, there's a significant portion of our budget that, that trails the calendar. Um, some of our debt service and the like. But right now, we're only about... Um, you know, 37% 
spent uh, almost at 50% of the year. Um, there's other things that look pretty good. So anyway, I'm just tossing it out to see, you know, um, it's in the budget. We can try to fill it. We can make this decision later. But I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm not as excited about it right now, given some of the other uh, personnel issues that we had. So. Any thoughts, immediate thoughts? Do you feel that you need uh, those services uh, rendered, uh, given the demand for those services right now? Right now, no. So, you know, um, I'm, the, I'm the deputy health officer. Um, whether you know it or not, you're I the know. health officer. I know it. Um, I've had, I've had uh, in 2022, I've had three calls, and that one was on that, you know, 25 below zero night that mm -hmm. I talked to you about back in January. Um, and then uh, I've had two other calls that have taken a little bit of time, but they have been bad. Um, animal control, uh, we're not getting a lot of calls about that right now. It's, you know, uh, I do handle, when there's a dog bite, um, not as the animal control officer because I'm not that, but the health officer does have uh, responsibilities if there's a dog bite, I think we've had three or four dog bites this year, none of which I've had to do anything except contact people and say, okay, keep your dog isolated for 10 days and please, uh, you know, pay your uh, dog license fee, which most of them still haven't. And, uh, you know, that's where an animal control officer, at least in theory, can go out and try to collect that from people. And then the other one is the ordinance enforcement. And frankly, we haven't had a lot of call for that. You know, back in 2020, under the pandemic, we had all the issues on mm -hmm. Wash Hill at the, at the boat launch. Uh, we have Hunger. issues on uh, Sweet Road with the Hunger Mountain Trailhead, but mm -hmm. of late, they haven't been too much. Uh, we've got, yeah. you know, right. Gary's problems. Yeah. I asked, I asked, uh, revitalizing Waterbury a couple of months ago uh, if they would do a business survey about do the businesses want more enforcement of the timed parking ordinance mm. on Main Street. And as, as you know, it's Waterbury, so the results came back and it was Five. 29 <laughs> wanted it and 28 didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Just like everything else. That is so classic for Waterbury. So, um, so, so the answer is no. Right now, there's no, I'm not feeling any pressure that, oh man, I need somebody to do this right away. So, maybe we should hold on. From my perspective, maybe um, saving that 20 grand can buy a few um, gallons of fuel, a few gallons of uh, <laughs> diesel fuel. And then when whoever's sitting here in December and January, the conversation can be had again. So. I guess my only concern on waiting is we felt a need enough to work to create the position. Um, then if we wait until the new person is here, are they then not only trying to learn this big, very difficult job, and then also trying to deal with these things? And we can't predict, maybe there'll be no calls for another nine months. But maybe things get crazy in the winter and you know, net net and all this stuff starts going on and we're like, oh shoot, wouldn't it have been really nice if we hired and trained someone? Um, so I I'm curious how much time and resource, how many time and re you know what I'm trying to say? Time and resources that would go into trying to advertise, would it be worth putting out, casting the net, seeing if we get some bites and or does that feel like a big um, ask right now? No, putting you know, advertising, going through that process. We, we advertised this job several years ago, probably three right. years ago. It was it part was part-time right. then and no benefits, right. and we had no takers at all. Right. Um, 
I mean, I, I'm okay. I, so we're just having a conversation, yeah. and, and I appreciate, you know, I, I see both sides mm -hmm. of it, and uh, I'm just looking for a little bit of guidance and, you know, kind of stop saying or maybe keep saying that, you know, it's going to be somebody else's problem and not Correct. too long in time. But, uh, so other thoughts or opinions or questions, anyway? I agree a little bit with Bill. But I hate kicking the thing that the can down the road a little bit, but I also believe that we're going to have a new, you know, manager, and they may have some perspectives as to what you know they want to see. Plus, we probably. You know, with everything that's happened with the recreation director's kind of position, you know, maybe that needs to settle out. I, you know, again, I don't like any municipal kind of ordinances going, you know, untattered, but I don't know if we're going to get, I, you know, right now I just question, you can't hire anyone for anything. Seems like it's going to be difficult. Well, yeah, but we wouldn't know that until we play. Right, until, so we, I think, until we add I don't think that's a reason not to do it. I think right. if we just think it's bad timing and we'd rather spend right. the money elsewhere, that's a good reason. Um, but but just because we might not get candidates, I don't yeah. think it's a solid reason not to try. No, I agree. Yeah. Do you have other way thoughts? I definitely, I do hear about dogs. I guess maybe I get fewer emails than you and Mike, so maybe they stick out more. <laughs> I mean, I think it's hard. I mean, you know, I live downtown. I walk on the cross from yeah. my trail. I'm not saying I think that needs to be our top universal priority is having someone to yell at people and their dogs. I mean, I echo exactly what you said, which is that I think having tried to hire a zoning minister in the planning commission, and it was our candidate, as everyone knows, um, if there it isn't a cost, I would say, advertise it, but I also think if we're doing that just to say that we did it because it was a good thing to say to prove we really didn't have get zero candidates, that's absolutely a waste of all of our time. Yeah, so. well, I mean, the, the advertising, it's, you know, it's going to cost a little bit to advertise, mm -hmm. but in the grand scheme of things, that's, that's not going to be the budget buster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, clearly I recommended this position. I thought there was a need. So, I'm, I'm just telling you that there's, we're in a little bit different place than we were in December and January when this was first talked about in, in a, a couple of different areas, including, you know, some pressures on the budget that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway. Uh, I would think maybe we can put a pause on this and revisit it in September. See if there is a heightened need and where we are in terms of the budget. Excellent. Thanks for that suggestion. Diesel doesn't go up to $10. Uh, get mine. Plus, we can ordinances, parking ordinances. I know. Clean that up in the meantime. Um, great, thanks, Bill. Okay, thank you. Well, if there's nothing else, um, we'll entertain the motion to adjourn. I just want to say one thing before we adjourn. I just want to make a public acknowledgement to Carla. I think it was really great. I got a uh, contact, I can't think of the woman's name. <laughs> At the ninth, it was like Friday night. And, First night of my vacation. Right. Uh, 9 40 p.m. And, and, it was like, and, and she, she was going to have her daughter married or something. Yeah. Like, and she was getting married on Saturday. Yeah, and she, she was, didn't she, get the license. Yeah. She was all, uh, we all got the begging pleading. Like, and I was I up, it has to be from Saturday. I, I was up at camp and I said, let me throw out. I said, I sent something to both Bill and Carla. Just in, I said, if, if Carla's not there, I, which I knew she might not be, maybe if Bill wound up seeing it, he might get someone to do something. And <laughs> I'm, what is I, this? A week ago Friday. Yeah, weekend, oh, Friday was, night. Yesterday I was bringing my mother right. out of town, too. So I just want to really acknowledge Carla for going the extra mile and yeah, helping, helping that woman out. I'm great. Thanks, Mike. So you gave her my cell phone number. Uh, I explicitly I thought I got really happy to have a cell. Where I was. I thought I was reading through, I get my office calls, which I shut off that Friday uh, night yeah. on my cell phone and later discovered that she it was had a direct. Yeah. Oh. Alyssa and I were both like, we're not at <laughs> <laughs> <We're not laughs> <40. laughs> Two thumbs up for Carl. <laughs> You're a keeper was the response I got after two. So yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, <well. laughs> appointments. But those, those are the kind of things that always go unnoticed with Bill and Carla do. And <laughs> That's what town clerks do. Yes. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Apparently, there was a huge wedding with a reception at the Country Club of Vermont, so I could, couldn't very well say, no, you can't perform the ceremony. Oh. oh. I mean, I guess they could have had the whole wedding. I just would have been like, oh, that's what I said. It was a legal ceremony. Yeah. And ask for forgiveness. Thanks. Without the powers vested in me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will move the wager. Second. Do we all vote on that one? I never know. Call in favor. Aye. 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 Aye.